Turn in your Bibles, if you will, please, to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel according to Luke. And when you find Luke's Gospel, turn with me to the 23rd chapter. Luke chapter number 23. Thank you for being in your places today. I sure want to encourage you to be in your place tonight. I don't think there's any question if we knew that the Lord was coming tonight for His church between 7 o'clock and 8.15, I know where you'd be. I think I know. Unless it's worse than I think it is. You want to be in church. On church night, serving the Lord, worshiping the Lord, singing the songs of Zion, and hearing the preaching from God's eternal Word. You cannot guarantee that He won't come. Because the Bible says, in an hour when we think not, the Son of Man cometh. So let's be here tonight. Let's have a good crowd on Sunday night in the Lord's house. And uh, be, come praying that the Lord will do something for each of us individually as we come to worship tonight. Luke chapter 23 in your Bibles. I'm reading one verse of Scripture found in verse number 33. Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. I want to talk to us today, this resurrection season, this season leading up to the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Savior. I want to speak to us a little while today on the sufferings of Calvary. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sunday school hour. We thank you now for this 11 o'clock service, this 11 o'clock hour. I want to thank you for the wonderful music that has set the tone for the preaching service. I want to thank you for your word. And Lord, may this word speak to our hearts in a powerful way. May we positionally find ourselves camped at the foot of the cross for just a few minutes. And may we, from your word, hear the cries of Calvary. May we one more time this side of eternity stop and consider the price that has been paid for our redemption. Help us not to forget it. Help us to remember it. And then help us to apply the results of it to our hearts. May the Spirit of God be pleased to speak to us in a powerful way in this service. And we'll thank you for it. Because we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. According to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 5, and verse number 5, Jerusalem is the center of the world. And it was at the center of the world that God chose to plant a cross and to put His Son upon that cross. At the intersection of heaven and earth, there stood a cross, a cross of redemption for you, for me, and for the entire world. Songwriters for years, hundreds, thousands of years, have been putting together the words of description to describe what took place at Calvary this morning thus far in our service. The songs, the music has been geared towards what happened at Calvary. The songwriter wrote on a hill far away, 
stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Another songwriter put it this way, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall never get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. When I think about the cross, I'm thinking about a story that I read just this week. A preacher who actually came from here in North Carolina many years ago, he's in heaven now, his name was Dr. Herschel Ford. Dr. Ford wrote probably 15 or 20 books, and he titled those books Simple Sermons. And he would say things like simple sermons on the resurrection, simple sermons on the return of Christ, simple sermons on Calvary. I was reading one of his sermons this week, and he was trying to convey the love of God on demonstration at Calvary. And he told a story about Western days in our country. There was a man walking uh, down the street, and he heard a group of horses pulling a wagon rushing forward down the street. And he noticed at a distance there was a young lady sitting in that wagon. She had no control over the horses. And she was terrified and she was screaming. And she was almost uh, hysterical because she'd, she felt that her life uh, was, was in grave danger. And this man walking down the street, as the team of horses got nearer, looked and noticed that his bride-to-be was sitting in that wagon. He left the sidewalk. He ran out and positioned himself in front of the team of horses, and he held on to them until he finally got them stopped. But during the process, he got trampled underneath of the horses. His bride-to-be climbed down off of the wagon came around where he was at, put her arm under his head and lifted him up where she heard him speak his last words when he said, I love you. He gave his life to save his bride-to-be's life. Now, when I read that story, I thought, now he's trying to give an illustration to help us understand the love of God at Calvary. But quite honestly, there's no illustration we can give. Uh, there's no depths that we can draw from. Uh, there's no experience that I know of in the world that can adequately describe God's love as it's on display at Calvary because it's beyond our ability to describe it. It's beyond our ability to comprehend the depths of the love of our God that would break the eternal fellowship between the Godhead to send His Son into this world to get to the cross and then to turn His back on His own Son so that He would never have to turn His back on us. My friend, that's love beyond description. I'm glad to be a recipient of it today. I'm glad the Lord has done that for us. But the songs that people have written remind us of the love of God at Calvary and the love of Christ in allowing himself to be nailed to that wicked, cruel cross of Calvary. And then not only are there the songs, but there are the multitude of verses in the Bible either directly or indirectly, which remind us of the price that our Savior paid on the cross of Calvary for us. There are literally nearly 30 verses in the New Testament 
which speaks to the cross of Calvary alone. And then there are other indirect verses that number in the dozens which speak to us about the results of Calvary. I'm reminded of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18 when he said, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 14, the apostle Paul trying to get a group of people to turn, turn from the law and embrace the marvelous truth of Calvary made this statement, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. In the book of Philippians chapter number 2, the apostle Paul talking about the incarnation of Christ and the end results of his coming into this world said, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In the book of Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 14, the Bible says, blotting out the hand written of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. In the Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. In the book of the Revelation, nearly 30 verses of Scripture in the last book of the Bible speak to the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world as a result of Calvary. And we see the glorified Christ on the other side of Calvary. We see the glorified Christ on the other side of the resurrection. We see him there enthroned in heaven. And as they look at him in heaven in Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 6, they reference what happened at Calvary. The Bible said, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all of the world. Up there in heaven, listen to what they say. He's a lamb that had been slain. How did they determine that? They determined that by the scars in his glorified body. Listen, don't forget this. Those of us who are going to heaven, when we get there and we see him, we're going to see the nail scar prints. We're going to see the, the place in his side where the spear entered his side and the blood came out and the water came out, signifying that Jesus had completely died. He didn't swoon on the cross. He died on the cross, but they didn't take his life from him. Jesus said, I have power to lay my life down and I have power to take it again. Jesus voluntarily and vicariously and victoriously laid his life down for us on Calvary's cross. And up there in glory, they look at the Son of God and they praise him. And forever we will be reminded of the price that Jesus paid for us to redeem us, to forgive us, to give us of his righteousness, to eventually bring us into his presence. Uh, there will always be that object lesson in front of us where the scars of Calvary will always be on demonstration to remind us of the price he paid for our redemption. And in the fifth chapter of the book of the Revelation, they speak to it. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Where was that blood shed? That blood was shed on Calvary's cross. Now the Bible not only talks about uh, the cross and the blood that was shed on the cross, but the Bible on numerous occasions reminds us of the sufferings of the cross. Uh, my friend, I've been around a lot of people through the years who've suffered. Uh, hell is a place of suffering. 
The Bible says there's weeping. And the Bible said there's wailing. And the Bible says there's gnashing of teeth in that awful cavern called hell. In this walk of life, I've been around a lot of people that suffered. A lot of people. I've heard the cries. I've heard the woes. I've heard the sufferings of pain. But I want you to know today, of all of the pain, look, if it was possible, it's not. If it were possible to take all of the sufferings that sin has placed upon the human race, all of the suffering, all of the heartbreaks, all of the tears that's ever been, all of the physical pain that the human race has ever suffered, if you could take it all and put it together, it would not be a drop in the bucket compared to the sufferings of Calvary. There have been movies put out by Hollywood actors where they have tried to depict the sufferings of Calvary. Uh, as wonderful, supposedly, I've never looked at them, but as wonderfully, supposedly, as those movies are, they could never, they could never, under any condition, could they never display the actual sufferings that Jesus Christ suffered on the cross of Calvary. Because it was not just, hear me well, it was not just Jesus suffering in his body like we would suffer should we be nailed to the cross. That's a horrible death. That was, a, that was the means of Roman persecution. That was the means that Romans used to put people to death. And it was a terrible death. It was a death of anguish. It was a death of immense and intense suffering. But that's not all that Jesus suffered on the cross of Calvary. Jesus on the cross of Calvary became sin for us. That means on the cross, the penalty that we should have paid forever was placed on Jesus. Not only did he feel the physical sufferings of a physical body, but he felt the eternal torments that we should have experienced throughout the endless ages of eternity. And my friend, I think right there would be, just be a good place just to stop giving an invitation. If somebody loves us that much that they're willing to take our place, they're willing to suffer in our place, they're willing to take the anguish in our place, they're willing to take the curse that God's placed on them in our place, we must not take that lightly. We must not get used to it. We must not get over it. We must be appreciative. We must be thankful for someone who would take the full penalty of our sins upon himself and say it is finished on the cross of Calvary and provide such a wonderful salvation for us, we ought to be appreciative. We ought to be thankful. We ought to say thank you, God, that you would love us enough to take our place, to die in our stead, to suffer for us on the cross of Calvary. And the New Testament talks about the sufferings of our Lord. Listen, if you will, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. For Christ also hath once suffered, listen to this phrase, far sins. Do you hear the story? Do you remember the story just came to my mind years ago? Uh, they had a, in a public school classroom years ago, uh, they had a lot of mischievous kids and they wouldn't pay attention and, and so they made up the rules and they let the class help make up the rules. And they said, okay, we gotta, we, we've got to get this under control. So they made up a set of rules. And if people were caught breaking the rules, they would get a paddling. And the class, they voted on it and they agreed to it. One day, a little boy in the room who came from a very poor family did not have any food at lunch. And he slipped around in one of the lunch boxes and got a sandwich. He stole the sandwich because he was hungry. And when the big brute that brought the sandwich found out that his lunch had been stolen, they began to ask around. And all of the evidence pointed to this little slim boy. He didn't have on good clothes. He came out of just terrible, terrible poverty. And the little boy, he acknowledged it. He said, I didn't have any breakfast this morning. He said, I didn't get to eat much yesterday. 
He said, I'm just so hungry, I can't hardly, couldn't hardly stand it. And he said, I, I know it's wrong, but I, I just slipped out when nobody was looking, and I got this sandwich out of this uh, lunchbox. And it so happened that the lunchbox he got the sandwich out belonged to the biggest brute in the class. And the teacher said to the class, you know what we voted on. You know what we've got to do. And the teacher said, son, come up here. We're going to have to give you a paddling. And he had a long coat on, and it was kind of ragged and torn. And, and the teacher said, now, son, you've got to pull your coat off. He said, teacher, please, please, I, I don't want to have to pull my coat off. Go ahead and paddle me. I don't want to pull my coat off. Please, I don't want to get rid of my coat. She said, son, you've got to pull your coat off so we can give you a paddling. He started crying, and he said, please, just give me a paddling, but don't, don't make me pull my coat off. The teacher said, son, the rules are the rules. You've got to pull your coat off. And he unbuttoned his coat and pulled it off. And his shirt was torn and just hanging on his body. That's all he had to wear. And he's so embarrassed. And they said, and the teacher said, now, son, bend over this chair. And she took a paddle. And she started to raise the paddle. And the big brute in the classroom said, wait, wait. I don't want you to paddle him. I come from a home that's got money. I come from a home that's got good clothes. I come from a home that's got food to eat. It's very obvious he has none of that. Don't you paddle him. Yes, he stole my sandwich, but don't you paddle him. The big brute said, I'll take his place. You let him go back to his desk. You place the lashes on me. I'll stand in for him. I'll take his place. My friend, that's Calvary. That's Calvary. I should have been there. You should have been there. I should have suffered in hell. You should have suffered in hell. And God should have sent us there. But all of a sudden, God said, hey, I love you. I'll take the blow for you. I'll take the suffering for you. I'll take the eternal hell for you. Let him go free. If you trust what I've done for you, you can go free. I'll take the full blunt of the penalty. I'll take the full blunt of the punishment for you. That's what happened at Calvary. He suffered for us. He suffered in our place. And let me tell you something. You and I never did one thing to deserve it. You say, I'm a pretty good person. You're not that good. You say, I've done a lot of good things. You haven't done enough. You say, I'm the bright bulb in the community. You may be the sharpest tool in the box, but you still need redemption. That's what Calvary is all about. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 18, for Christ hath once suffered for sins. In Acts chapter 17, verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. In 1 Peter again, chapter 4 and verse number 1, the Bible said, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Listen to what he said. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh. Listen to that. How did he suffer for us? He suffered for us in the flesh. Now listen closely. The only way God could suffer for us was for God to take on a physical body. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit. You don't nail a spirit to the cross. But God, spirit, incarnation, Philippians chapter 2, took on a body like you have. Took on a body like I've got. Listen closely. What was the purpose of Bethlehem? Calvary. Mary gave Jesus a body so that body ultimately could be nailed to a cross. And he suffered for us in the flesh. Now I want you to turn in your Bibles, please. And I want us to look at some of this suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible in our text verse says, 
that when they were come to a place called Calvary, there they crucified him. I want you to turn it over to the next book, the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John. And I want us to notice something vitally important about the sufferings of our Savior. I want you to notice in John chapter 19, begin reading in verse number 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Now, I want to point out some things in these verses and other verses. Sometimes we read the Bible and we read over things. It never registers. It doesn't dawn on us what's being said. I want you to look in your Bibles at the last part of verse number 3. The Bible says in John 19, 3, that they smote him with their hands. Let me tell you what the Romans did when the Bible says they smote him with their hands. That was a game that the Romans played around the cross of Calvary. What they did was they would take the soldiers and they would play a game with the individual who was to be crucified. Here's the way it worked. However many people would gather around him, these people would hold their fist up in the presence of the person who's to be crucified. All of them. Maybe there's five, maybe there's 10, maybe there's 15. We don't know. But they would hold their fist up like that. Then they would blindfold the person who is to be crucified. Now, let's just use an illustration. Let's say there's five people standing in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now they're going to say to Jesus, all of these, all of these five people, all these soldiers, they're going to hold their fist up like that. Then we're going to blindfold you. And four out of the five will hit you as hard as they can hit you with their fist. Then after the four of the five hit you, we're going to pull the blindfold off of you. And then you're to tell us which one of the five did not hit you. If you can tell us which one of the five did not hit you, we will take you on to crucifixion. If you cannot guess which one of the five hit you, we will blindfold you again and they will hit you again and we'll pull the blindfold off and then you guess, you tell us which one of the five did not hit you. Now here's what they did. They had the opportunity to take their fist and hit the person to be crucified as hard as as they could. I've noticed recently coming across some things on my uh, phone. I wish they'd get back to the phone that was just a phone. <laughs> but sometimes something comes up on my screen and I notice that there's some idiots. They're double idiots. No, 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 excuse me. They're triple idiots. Uh, no, excuse me. They're quadrupled idiots. No, excuse me. They're just idiot, idiot. And they stand at a table. And somebody comes on the other side of the table and they get the opportunity at the count of three to hit them upside the head. Have you ever seen that? Stupid. I mean, somebody crawled out from under a rock, but they left their brain under the rock. And I've seen some of them. They hit that opponent and they got a bunch of people standing around him to catch him when he goes down. I noticed the other day, they caught this guy and he's shaking his head and he just passed Jupiter and Mars and Saturn. And, and, and they get him up and they prop him up. And now he gets to hit the opponent. 
But he's so weak, he can't hardly stand there. And they hit each other, just like it's fun and people clout. Stupid. Did I say stupid? It's worse than that. And I think about that, and I think about what they did to Jesus. They are, they have the opportunity to take their fist and draw back just as hard as they can and hit him. And that's what they did. They played games with the Son of God. You know, when I read that, that that's what that verse means. I've been around people who've been hit in the head. Your head will suddenly swell like probably no other part of your body. Could you imagine some huge Roman soldier taking his fist, hitting Christ in the head or hitting him in the chest or on the shoulder or in the back? And everybody gets their turn like a bunch of dogs trying to eat a rabbit. And everybody gets their turn. And they take that fist and they hit him as hard as they can. And then after the four or the five or whomever has hit him, they pull his blindfold off and they'll say, okay, look at these five. Which one did not hit you? Here's the deal. Obviously, they'll never tell the truth. Obviously, the one that didn't hit will never be acknowledged. You know why? Because they want to hit him again. And they hit him again. And they hit the individual as long as he can stand on his feet. And I would imagine that it would be very difficult after people had taken turns with their fist hitting somebody. I would imagine it would be very difficult to remain on your feet. And the head would probably be swollen and places where they've been hit will be bruised uh, and possibly bleeding, bleeding and they'll be swollen. That's what that phrase means there. In John chapter number 19 and verse number 3, and they smote him with their hands. They used Jesus to play games with. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse number 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. Wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for us. Many years ago, a Christian doctor who happened to be a surgeon was reading Isaiah 53 one day, verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions, and he said, wow, wounded. He said, I'm, I'm familiar of those who are wounded. And he got to thinking about the people he had treated in his office or the people he had treated in the operating room or the people he had treated in the emergency room. And he came up with the conclusion that that word wounded there talks about five different types of wounds. And he shares that with us. Let me give them to you. Because they represent the wounds that our Savior endured on the cross of Calvary. He was wounded for our transgression. First of all, he had what a surgeon would call a contused wound. That's a wound that's produced by a blunt instrument, such as a rod. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 30, they placed a crown of thorns on his head and drove the thorns into his skull with a reed or a rod. I want you to think about this just a minute. Could you imagine somebody taking a heavy reed or rod and coming down over your head or coming down over your shoulders? The Apostle Paul experienced that to some extent. He said he was beaten with rods. Could you imagine? But here's what I want you to get, and I'll get to the rest of it in just a moment. They have placed a crown of thorns on the head of our Savior. Those thorns were something like two to three inches long, and they wove a crown of thorns, and they set that crown of thorns up there on the head of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they took a reed, and they hit him on the head. And when they hit those thorns, those thorns penetrated down through the flesh. Down to the very skeletal system of the Lord Jesus Christ. Could you imagine somebody 
placing thorns on your head and then driving them down into the scalp. That's what Jesus endured. Could you imagine the pain? Could you see the blood as it begins to run down the face, run down the back? Could you get the picture? Do you get the mental picture when they're beating him on the head and driving those thorns into his body? He was wounded at Calvary for our transgression. There's a second wound. It's called a lacerated wound, the surgeon says. And this is the wound that I want to talk to you about next. Because Isaiah 5, chapter 50, verse number 6 says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the beard. I hid not my face from the shame and the spitting. Isaiah prophesied that the day would come when Christ would go to the cross and they would pluck his beard out. Could you imagine the pain one would feel if they plucked the beard off of the face? Could you imagine the pain one would experience through the process of scourging, which I'll talk about in just a second? Isaiah said they did all of that plus they spit on the Lord Jesus Christ. Could you imagine some of these burly Roman soldiers and, and possibly some of the people on the way to Calvary as he walks through the Viva Dolorosa with a, with a cross thrown, thrown across his back? Could you imagine people on the way, the Jews especially, as they would spit on the Son of God and probably spittle was dripping off of his chin, probably spittle was dripping off of his hair, probably spittle was dripping off of his body. That's what they did to my Savior for you and he did it for me. I don't know of anything more demeaning in my life than for somebody to walk up to you and spit on you. But the Bible says that's what they did to our Savior. And the Bible says in John 19, 1, where you're at. And then Pilate therefore took Jesus and he scourged him. Let me talk to you about that just a minute. He who knew no sin became sin for us. The scourging process was a wicked process. It was an embarrassing process. Not only was it painful, not only did multitudes of people die from scourging, and Jesus should have died from scourging because of the way they scourged him, but he couldn't die from scourging because the Old Testament prophesied that he was going to be on a cross. He had to get to the cross. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness in the New Testament, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus had to be lifted up on a cross. The first thing they did to an individual who's going to be scourged is they take all of his clothes off of his body. Naked. Naked standing before the crowd to be scourged by a bunch of people who themselves are criminals. You know, sometimes we, we read about the scourging of Christ and we kind of put it at certain parts of the body. We say the back or we say the stomach area. But scourging affected all parts of the body. They would place the scourge around the legs of people and they would pull the scourge and rip the muscles and the tendons out of the legs. The flesh of the legs would lay open. They would, they would place the scourge around the stomach area. They'd place the scourge around the back area. And they'd lay the flesh open. They would take the individual and they would tie them to a post. And there's nothing they can do. And it's very interesting. History records, we don't hear this often, but nevertheless history records a true event of the way most scourgings took place. And it simply went this way. There was two people. 
for each felon. Two people did the scourging. They would take a handle of wood and they would tie into the end of the handle leather thongs, long leather thongs. And in the opposite end of those leather thongs, they would put wire or pieces of sharp bone or sharp gravel. And they would tie the felon. This is what they did to Jesus. And somebody would stand in front of them and wrap that scourge around their back. And once it goes around, they'd hit it with a whiplash. And it would go around and stick into the skin. And then they would rip it. And as they rip it, it rips the skin. It lays the skin open. It tears portions of the skin off of the body. And then somebody standing behind the felon would take that scourge and wrap it around the person's back. Somebody from behind's wrapping it around their stomach. Somebody from the other side's wrapping it around their back. And they're scourging. And this is what happened to Jesus. Somebody stood behind the Lord Jesus Christ and he had his hands tied and they stood behind him and they took this long scourge and they, they, they came around as fast as they could throw it like that and those leather throngs ripped around and, and, and wrapped around his body and once they wrapped around it, then they would jerk it. When they jerked it, it tore the flesh open like you'd take a knife and open up the flesh. And then after somebody stood in front of him and did that to his back, Somebody stood behind him, and they would take that scourge and do the same thing. They'd wrap it around his stomach area, and then they would pull it, and his stomach and the flesh and the chest would rip open. Those who have recorded those events have said this, that in many instances after the back has been laid open, the spinal column was visible to see. Those who have recorded these events said that when they would rip the stomach area open, the intestines would fall out. And many people passed out. And many people died just under the scourging itself. That's what our Savior endured. Stripped naked, beaten with a fist, the scourge laying his chest open and his stomach open and his legs and his back. And then if that's not enough, they place a rugged cross on the top of the flesh that's laid open. No wonder the Bible said he fell beneath the load. The heart rate it has gone through the roof. Because the blood is coming out of the body and the heart is having to pump harder and faster to try to get the necessary blood to all of the important parts of the body. That's what Jesus endured for you. That's what Jesus endured for me. Are we grateful? Are we thankful? The Bible said that he, his body was so torn that he did not look like a human being. Isaiah said it this way in 52, 14. As many as were astonished at the, his visage was so marred more than any man. That word marred means defaced. It means he did not retain the appearance of a man. The beating of the fist, the hitting of the reed, the body being laid open. And many times when they'd pull that scourge out, large chunks of meat would be ripped out of the body. That's what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Then there's what's called the penetrating wound. The Bible says... And I mentioned this a moment ago, but I want to enlarge on it in closing. The penetrating wound was, were, were the thorns that they put on the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these were thorns that were grown in that part of the world. As I said, they're two to three inches in length. 
and the cruel Roman soldiers, they go out and get those thorns, and then they tie them together in a crown. Why are they doing that? Listen closely. Why are they doing that? Because they say he needs to be crucified because he says he's a king. So here's what they do. They say, you say you're king. Okay, we're going to put a crown on your head. And so they put a crown of thorns up there. It is an instrument of mockery. They're mockery. In the Old Testament scriptures, the Bible says in the book of Genesis about the curse that's placed upon this earth, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. And that means that Jesus has become the curse for us. And then they put a purple robe on him, which is what the king would wear. And they mock him. And then they say, Hail, King of the Jews, with a blood running down his body. Hail, King of the Jews, with a purple robe on him. Hail, King of the Jews. They're mocking him. They're making fun of him. But what they don't know is he was King of the Jews. What they don't know is he's our King. And in the book of the Revelation, chapter number 19, he's coming back to fight the battle of Armageddon. And the Bible said that he's sitting on a big white horse. Uh, and as he comes out, he's called the Word of God. Uh, and there's a sharp two-edged sword that goes out of his mouth by which he smites the world, the, the kingdoms of this world and the armies of this world. And he fights the battle of Armageddon. And he wins because he's King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, you can put a crown of thorns on his head and you can make fun of him. Uh, but let me tell you, he's going to have another crown on his head, and it's called a diadema. And the diadema is a crown that only kings wear. And he's coming back with a crown that will say to the world, I've been king all along, and I'm victorious king. <laughs> then in la lastly, lastly, there's the perforating wound. They took our Savior and they drove nails. They perforated his hands and his feet. And they nailed him to a cross. I've tried to imagine this. Wait a minute. All the sufferings that I have heretofore described that Jesus has already gone through, and now they add misery to insult. His back's laid open, his stomach's laid open, his body's laid open, and now they're laying him on a cross. And can you imagine the pain that would be inflicted if you laid your hand on this communion table and somebody took a big spike with a hammer and they drove it through your hands? That's what Jesus had to endure. And I can see him as a group of Roman soldiers would pull that cross up. Then they'd push it over and it drop down in that hole. And as it drops down in that hole, the body will swing up and down and the flesh was probably tearing in his hands and in his feet. Preparating wound. It's very interesting that none of the Gospels actually talk about him being nailed it's not until we read the Gospels that we find Jesus in the upper room with his doubting disciples. And he shows them his hand. His hands and his side. And they believed. But the Baptist Thomas was not there. And Thomas said, unless I see the prints of the nails, unless I can put my hand in those prints, I will not believe. And suddenly Jesus appears in the room without a window being open, without a door being open. Jesus appears in their midst and he says to Thomas, Thomas, come here. Put your hand in my hands. Put your hand in my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas looked and said, my Lord and my God. the perforating wounds. 
And I know I said last, this is last. The incest wound, I-N-C-I-S-E-D. That's a wound that's produced by a sharp-edged instrument. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. The seven sayings been uttered from the cross. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. Our Savior's endured the scourgings, the beatings, the spittle, the nails, becoming sin for us on the cross for three hours. The earth has been engulfed in a blanket of darkness. And Jesus said, it's finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it, the plan of salvation. Hallelujah. It's finished. And a cruel Roman soldier brings a spear, stands beneath the cross, and pushes that spear, that spear up through the side of our Savior into his heart. And the Bible said that blood and water came out, which signifies he's not swimming. He is physically and literally dead. Well, let me say this in closing. When it all started back in the garden, God created Adam. And God said, it's not good that men be alone. He put Adam to sleep. And when he put him to sleep, he opened up his side. He took a rib out of the side of Adam. And the Hebrew word is, he built. He built a woman. God, out of the side of Adam... Build a bride. Is it registering? Amen, brother. Out of the sight of Adam, God built a bride. And he brought them back together. And that cruel soldier hit the heart of our Savior. And he opened up a fountain. And that fountain has been flowing. For 2,000 years, it is the fountain of the perfect, precious, sinless blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood that he took back into the Father's presence and he deposited that perfect blood yonder in heaven. And that blood is the blood that cleanses us, that cleanses us, that cleanses us, that forgives us, that washes us. And 2,000 years, uh, he has been building a bride because of the flow that started running 2,000 years ago. And she's still, still cleansing. She's still forgiving. She's still doing the work of building a bride. And one of these days, she's going to be presented to the Lord. Zechariah said it this way in chapter 13, verse 1. In that day, there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanliness. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners which plunge beneath that flood lose all of their guilty stains. If you've never been saved, there's a fountain. If your sins are not forgiven, there's a fountain. At this very moment, it continues to flow. It's available. And it's available to all. Whosoever, let him come and take of the water of life freely. It's yours. All you have to do is reach out by faith and say, yes, I take Jesus as my Savior. What he did, 
what he did to ransom us. And I haven't touched the hem of the garment. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Our eyes closed. I wonder if there'd be one here today that would raise your hand and you would say, Pastor, I've never been saved. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has never washed away my sins. If I died today, I'd be lost, or I'm not sure I'm saved. Pray for me. Slip your hand up. Let me pray for you anywhere in the building. I'm not sure. I'm saved. I see a hand. Anyone else? Let me ask you this, Christian. Please listen to this. Now that you're saved, and now that once again we've been reminded of the price that Jesus has paid for us, don't you think it might be just well for us to do something that Jesus did? Everybody he called, he called them openly and publicly. Don't you think it might just be good if we just one more time get around an altar and say, Lord, I just want to take a minute not to ask anything. I just want to take a minute to thank you, to thank you for the sufferings, to thank you for the pain that you endured for me. Lord, I just want to take a few moments and thank you. Our Father, as I approach your presence today in the name that's above every name, the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the name of the Savior of the world, I just want to pause and say thank you. Lord, there are no words to describe my appreciation. They don't exist. Lord, you're aware of the fact if I could speak every language of the world, there would not be enough words to describe my appreciation to you for what you've done for us. But from the very recesses of my soul, Lord, all I know to say is thank you. I don't understand why you did it, but I thank you that you did. Thank you for the scourging, the suffering, the spittle, the fist, all of the rebuffing that you had to experience. Thank you. Help all of us as we leave this building today to be more appreciative than we've ever been in our lives for the cost and the price of Calvary. And I'll thank you for all you've done and continue to do in Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake. And everybody said.